Uh, today, uh, we're going to hear about some uh, really interesting um, ungrouped achondrites. Uh, I won't I won't spill the beans exactly about what the, what what they are, but let leave that to Zoltan. But uh, I, you know, I think it's really it's sort of an yet another chapter in the saga of ungrouped achondrites. There there are, there are more and more ungrouped achondrites as we. Uh, you know, get more samples out of uh, the Sahara Desert. And um, so this, this is an, another set of these. And um, Zoltan, for those of you who don't know Zoltan really well, he is a, a PhD student. He is uh, nearing the completion of his PhD. I think we'll have that uh, all sewn up in the spring. And uh, he uh, did a master's degree here uh, uh, and then decided to stay on for a PhD. Uh, been working on Martian meteorites and ungrouped achondrites primarily. And so I guess without further ado, I'll um, hand it over to Zoltan and he can tell us all about ultramafic cumulate brecheos, probably from Vesta. Um, thanks, Carl. So um, yeah, welcome to my <clears throat> IOM presentation. Um, I'll just give you a brief overview of these rocks. We started working on these about a year and a half ago now um, and we initially thought that they were from an unknown parent body and we still think that but uh, more and more clues are coming in that kind of suggest that they're from Vesta. So um, they're olivine rich rocks, um, there's a dunite and two lurtholites and that suggests that they have to do something with, with, this, uh, with this missing mantle problem or, or great dunite shortage as it's called, been called in the literature. So, um, advance. This, uh, <clears throat> this missing mantle problem or great dunite shortage is basically this paucity of, of, of olivine rich material um, that's both in the asteroids um, viewed through remote sensing and also visible in the meteorite record. So there, does, there just isn't a lot of olivine rich material um, in, the, in the planetary sciences and this this doesn't really make sense given that um, that <clears throat> during the early solar system a lot of differentiation took place and um, you have this population of planetesimals forming uh, with uh, iron nickel cores, olivine rich or dun dunitic mantles and basaltic crust. This is generally agreed that planets differentiate this way. And then we these these things were these early planetesimals were were blown apart in the impact phase of planet of planet formation. And then their, their remains kind of populate the, the asteroid belt um, that you can see a map up here. Um, and so if, if the iron meteorites are representative of these, these iron cores, and there are a lot of iron meteorites in a lot of different compositions, um, basaltic meteorites represent the crusts of these, uh, these differentiated planetesimals, then the, it begs the question, where are these, these olivine-rich mantles? They should be abundant. I mean, they should be the dominant material found in the asteroid belt. And this was um, <clears throat> one, one idea that is that the, these these materials were were battered to bits. So essentially, they were they were destroyed um, in the impact phase of, of planet formation. So <clears throat> here is um, just a schematic cartoon of what we are we're talking about. We're talking about differentiated uh, planetesimals, um, and this is from Weiss 2013 review article on on differentiation in the early solar system. And there's, there's three possibilities. One is that you have these early formed materials um, form these large bodies. Uh, so chondrites and chondritic materials um, clump together and accrete and they differentiate and they form iron nickel uh, cores and mantles <clears throat> and olivine rich mantles. And then um, undifferentiated materials continue to accrete onto these differentiated materials uh, after um, aluminum 26 is is extinct, which is the primary heat source that causes the the melting of these materials. And then you know, these large bodies are then disrupted by impacts. Alternatively, you could have a scenario where some parent some parent bodies are completely undifferentiated, so they um, the chondritic materials clump together, but they never melt. And then other parent bodies, other planetesimals clump together and, and do melt the larger ones and fully differentiate. And then again, catastrophic impacts resulting in a mixing of all of this material. Um, or model C is you have like a range of these, uh, <clears throat> you have all three of these, these circumstances. So you have 
completely undifferentiated materials, and this would be um, chondritic materials that increase in, in metamorphic gradient as you get deeper into the parent body, um, but never fully melt because they're not large enough, there's not enough heat. Um, and then you have the other end member of these fully melted planetesimals, and then planetesimals that melted and then form these, uh, these kind of these layers um, of, of undifferentiated material that accrete onto them after the, the differentiation has been completed, and then again, disrupted by impact. Um, and so here's an example of, of what these materials look like now. They're basically rubble piles. So here's the asteroid Itokawa. Um, so these, these materials should all be represented in these, in these asteroidal samples. <clears throat> um, so in the asteroids, remote sensing tells us that the majority of the asteroid belt is this, or these C-type asteroids, and these are um, carbonaceous, uh, primitive, and volatile rich, and potentially the origin of the, the carbonaceous chondrites. And this is, like you said, 75% of the mass of, of the asteroid belt. Then there are S-type materials, um, this is 17% roughly of the asteroid belt, and these are siliceous and thought to be the origin of the ordinary chondrite um, <clears throat> meteorites. And then, and all of these are, you know, rubble piles, presumably, or, or pieces of, of, of disrupted materials. Um, and then the M-type is the third, third most common, and these are iron made of iron, primarily iron nickel metal, and potentially these represent the disrupted cores of these differentiated planet -less animals. Um, and then there are the B-type asteroids, that's Vesta and the Vestoids. So that Vesta is basically a differentiated planetesimal that escaped um, the giant impact phase and remains intact to this day. The E-type, these are potentially representative of enstatite rich, uh, <coughs> enstatite chondrite rich material. Um, and then finally the A-type. And the A-type asteroid, asteroids would represent the, the olivine rich materials of these asteroid mantles. And here I'm showing these different spectral types. So these are diagnosed based on the <clears throat> absorption pattern, patterns that they have from ground-based observations. And you have all these different types. Um, and the A types have this characteristic, uh, this shape that's uh, indicative of having a lot of olivine-rich material. So if what I said before is true, that you know there's all this differentiated material and <clears throat> there should be a lot of olivine-rich material in in the asteroid belt, well, what you actually see is that less than 0.01% of the asteroid belt is composed of these, these A-type materials. Um, and so here's, this is from Wikipedia, I pulled just a list of all the A-type asteroids. Um, there, there really aren't many of them. And so there seems to be this olivine shortage in the asteroid belt from remote observation because there aren't nearly as many <clears throat> A-type asteroids as there should be if there was widespread differentiation among early planetesimals. Um, so what could cause this? Uh, space weathering is one example. Um, basically, <clears throat> weathering of materials in space from, from charged particles uh, released by the sun causes um, darkening of the spectra. You get these uh, iron nanoparticles that get implanted in, um, in planetesimal surfaces or in any kind of material surfaces. <laughs> that, don't have, that don't have atmospheres. Um, however, this is problematic because Vesta doesn't show that kind of space weathering effect. And, you know, Vesta is like a prime example of this and it doesn't show this, this characteristic darkening of the spectra. Um, alternatively, these mantles might be covered with exogenous material. So just through, through the impact and regolith uh, gardening and you know, through the billions of years of solar system evolution, maybe these mantles were covered with other material that obscures their, their spectra. Um, and that's, that's certainly a possibility. And then there's also the, the batter to bits scenario, um, first suggested by Bergen et al. Um, in 1996. And that suggests that asteroid mantles have been systematically destroyed by impacts. Um, and this would have been, you know, in the first few million years of solar system history uh, during the chaotic growth phase of these planetesimals. Um, and this suggests that mantles were destroyed and the, the dunites that composed these mantles were ground into smaller than meter sized objects that then fell into the sun or uh, alternatively got accreted onto larger planets like the Earth, you know, Mars, et cetera. <clears throat> um, so that was, the, that was just a summary of the, the asteroidal evidence for this. There's also evidence for this dunite shortage in the meteorite record. So, 
given the oxygen isotope diversity in meteorites, so this is a, just <clears throat> this familiar triple oxygen diagram showing all of the oxygen compositions of, of uh, <coughs> triple oxygen compositions of these different meteorites. Um, so given this kind of heterogeneity in, in composition that had to be inherited uh, from the nebula before these, these bodies formed, um, along with the various different iron uh, meteorite types implies like up to 100, around 100 unique differentiated parent bodies. So uh, this again begs the question, where are all of the dunites that would have formed from these differentiated parent bodies? We have examples of crusts and uh, <clears throat> various um, other materials, but, but not really the, the mantle material. Um, there are all the enriched meteorites in the record. Example is among the HED meteorites, the diogenites contain olivine, but not much. Um, there is one di dunitic diogenite. Uh, this is Miller range 03443, studied by Beck et al. 2011. Um, and this is a cumulate. This is thought to be a cumulate dunite from a flat fractionating magnet chamber on Vesta. So here's just a chart of showing all the different um, materials in the diogenites, um, the, which are composed primarily of, of uh, Orthopyroxene, clinopyroxene, and olivine, and there are <coughs> very few dunitic materials. There's just this one uh, meteorite that represents this, this dunitic uh, material. The rest of them are mostly composed of orthopyroxene. And Zoltan, just, uh, Zoltan, this is Mindy. Um, I think yeah. there might be more than just that one. I need to check my records, but you may have access to um, at least one, I think, NWA diogenite, which is dunitic in composition. Cool. Um, that's good to know. Yeah, I'd like to uh, look at that. So later on, we're going to see how these might be related to the Vestoids. So yeah, that, that's definitely interesting. Thanks for that. <clears throat> um, so in any case, the diogenites are, are the diogenites, which are um, the lower crustal cumulate materials from Vesta as opposed to the eucrites, which are more um, crustal materials and more um, logically rich. These uh, don't have much olivine and you know, examples with olivine are fewer, few and far between. Um, then there are the Brachonite meteorites and these are different from, these are not related to Vesta. These are their own kind of thing. They're forsteritic, <coughs> FO70, um, dunitic to whirlitic rocks. Uh, they have high amounts of calcium in the olivine. They have um, chondritic, highly siderophile element values. And because of this, people have suggested that they're likely melt residues of, of chondrite partial melting. So as opposed to diogenites, which you know, are likely cumulates of magma chambers, um, these brachinites are likely just when you partially melt chondritic material, undifferentiated chondritic material, you end up with um, something like a <clears throat> GRA, which is a, a, a feldspar-rich meteorite, and then these these brachionites could be um, have been suggested to be the the cumulates that form, or sorry, the the residues of these partial melting that forms from this meteorite. And um, as such, they're they're primitive achondrites. So this is a graph from Goodrich et al. 2017. This is showing uh, molar iron to mag magnesium in all of the inverses molar iron to manganese and olivine. And the cumulate materials form igneous fractionation trends that vary the iron to mag magnesium ratio in, their, in these materials. Whereas these other <coughs> meteorites, these primitive achondrites, the brachinites of which are the olivine rich, um, form this, this other trend. And this trend is indicative of some sort of redox um, reaction as opposed to fractionation in an, in an igneous uh, cumulate pile. Um, other olivine rich meteorites include the urolites. Um, some of these are olivine rich and these are FO 75 to 95 olivines, um, they, but <clears throat> they also have these interesting features. They have these reduction rims around, uh, around the olivine grains. Um, they have high carbon content so up to five weight percent reduced carbon in these things. 
Um, and there's, there's an extreme oxygen isotopic diversity shown in, in the Uralite. So this is, a, this is an oxygen uh, isotope diagram showing uh, big delta 17 O on the y-axis and <clears throat> little delta 18 O on the, on the x-axis. And this is showing just this large range of uh, oxygen isotope data, again, suggesting that these are primitive achondrites that um, didn't fully equilibrate as they melted. Um, and this is likely from a heterogeneous asteroid with, with a low degree of magnetic processing, as opposed to like the HEDs or the Angrites or <clears throat> these other groups that form these more tight um, clusters, suggesting that the entire uh, parent body equilibrated. <clears throat> and finally, the Angrites. Um, there is one Dunedic Angrite, um, NWA8535. And this is 92% olivine with um, pretty, pretty forsteritic composition, uh, forsterite 70 to 88. Um, and these are unique in that they have superchondritic calcium to aluminum. They have a lot of calcium included in the olivine and in the pyroxene. Um, the olivine in this meteorite is, is chrome rich. And the iron to manganese ratio, along with you know, all the other angrites, is, is around 90. So just keep this in mind as I'm <clears throat> discussing the new meteorites that we found. So, these are the few olivine rich meteorites we have in this in our in the collection. Um, and they're totally different from what I'm about to describe. <clears throat> so where is all this dunite in this in this uh, solar system? Um, the, as, as you can see, there's a paucity in both the asteroid uh, in both the remote observations of asteroids and in the meteorite record. So Asfaug et al. Um, in the various in the string of papers has suggested that hit and run collisions are responsible for stripping the olivine from these these differentiated planet bodies. And so this is showing that basically you have a you know, 500 kilometer object hit at high speed by a by a smaller object. Um, so at, at, at a lower speed, uh, this object is able to retain a lot of its a lot of its mantle. Um, and the smaller object is basically destroyed and the, the object sort of reaccretes. But at higher speeds, um, you get a complete stripping away of these, this mantle material and like a total destruction of, of both of these, these objects. And so um, Eric Osfog has suggested that uh, it's kind of like a, like a coin toss. Some of these planetesimals um, survive because of the, the nature of these, these impacts and other ones have their mantles completely stripped away. And um, they've suggested that mercury is like an analog of, of is, is, is uh, <clears throat> suggestive of this, this type of process because mercury has basically lost most of its mantle. Um, so that's one possibility of how this happens. So I wanna get into uh, these new meteorite finds. Um, this is the first one that we worked on. This is a 2015 find, Northwest Africa uh, 12 to 17. It's Monomic Dunite Brecha. And it's 93 volume percent olivine. Um, as a, <clears throat> in contrast to those primitive achondrites I discussed, this is really high forsterite content, so magnesium rich olivine, forsterite 86 to 93. Um, and the iron man and to manganese ratio of this meteorite is uh, around 38, which is a lot lower than, um, than the angrites <clears throat> in particular, um, and similar to the range of the HED uh, meteorites. Um, only around four volume percent pyroxene in here, and minor phases include uh, chromite, iron sulfide, iron nickel metal, um, some andesine plagioclase, and then really minor amounts of alkali feldspar, um, fluoro merylite, and uh, even free silica. Um, we found in these. Um, NWA12562 was the second one we identified, um, and this is a lurtzolite, so this has got slightly less olivine than the previous one. Um, <clears throat> again, high forsterite content, but more of a range, so forsterite 73 to 92, and iron to manganese um, within the range of the other ones, so around 46. And this one has nine volume percent uh, pyroxene. Um, minor phases are the same, so there's minor chromite, uh, iron sulfide, iron nickel metal, and uh, some plagioclase. Um, in this one, we didn't find any um, K feldspar or, or silica. And this, this sample is a lot more heavily brecciated than NWA 12217. And um, <clears throat> both of these meteorites have, have these interesting symplectites that I'll get into a little bit later. And then finally, NWA 12319. Uh, 
this was found later, but for some reason it got a, <clears throat> a lower uh, number. I guess it was uh, submitted for characterization earlier. Um, it's 2018 find. And this is again a monomix lurthalite breccia. This one is uh, 80, around 85% volume percent olivine. Um, similar forsterite content, 77 to 91, and similar iron to manganese content, and around 9 volume percent pyroxene. And this is this again has the same um, gr group of minor phases. And this meteorite is very, very similar to 12562. Um, likely all of these are paired, but in particular, these two are like almost identical. So if you showed me a probe mount of both of these, I wouldn't be able to tell which one's which. Um, so <clears throat> the oxygen isotopes of these meteorites um, plot in the vicinity of the HED meteorites, the Bractionites, um, and the Angrites. So here is the terrestrial fractionation line at zero, uh, big delta 17, and these plot essentially <clears throat> um, such that they could be a member of any of these groups, or they could be associated with any of these groups, or they could be from their own parent body. But this essentially rolls out any, um, any association with the Uralites, since it's not anywhere near there. Um, here is just a backscatter electron image of NWA12217. Um, this is with the contrast turned all the way up, and even so, it's basically just one like, gray area. You can see some pyroxenes in here, um, and here these might be pyroxenes, um, a chromite, and then this has these interesting veins, which I'll also get into, um, and these symplectite features that you can see over here. But essentially, it's just a big hunk of olivine. <clears throat> um, although it's brecciated, it's really hard to see any kind of matrix material, but it doesn't show any kind of small grain, fine grain matrix material in backscatter electron imagery. Um, NWA12562 and also uh, 12319 look more like this. As you can see, it's a lot more um, heavily fractured and uh, it looks just like more brecciated of a sample and less uh, compacted and sintered together. Um, and the other one, these, these large bright phases are uh, sulfide grains. And um, there are <clears throat> some plagioclase grains hidden among here that are really difficult to see. but um, it's, it's generally, again, just mostly olivine. Um, here is a thin section image of NWA 12217. I'm um, showing this to show like the, the texture of these meteorites. Um, we switch to uh, cross polarized, so this is plain polarized light. If we switch to cross polarized light, you can see these large grains uh, surrounded by what looks to be um, fine grained matrix material. Um, that's common in a, in a breccia. But if you zoom into these areas, you can see that these fine-grained areas are actually just other olivine grains in there. And if we go to um, cross-polarized light, you can see that this fine-grained looking material is actually just competent olivine grains, so full olivine grains that have been it, what appears to be uh, mosaicized by shock. So you have Lots of shock features in these meteorites. There are um, planar fractures among the olivines, and among a lot of them, there's this shock mosaicism, suggesting um, a moderate amount of shock has, uh, has affected these meteorites. And I think what's happened is the reason that this kind of texture doesn't appear in DSC is because there's just these are just olivine grains. So these, these grains have been likely sintered together by this um, shock uh, brecciation process. And so here's a BSC of that fine grain material. You can see like this is this would be an example of that fine, you know, quote unquote fine grained uh, material, but it's actually just one olivine grain that's been uh, mosaicized by, by shock. <clears throat> uh, moving on to mineral chemistry. Um, this is showing the pyroxene compositions in all three of these meteorites. So from here on out, NWA. Um, uh, 12217 is open circles, NWA 12319 is this uh, half moon shape, and then NWA 12562 uh, is these, uh, these crossed circles. So you can see that NWA 12217 displays a pretty restricted um, pyroxene composition. Uh, it's bimodal, so CA rich pyroxene and uh, <clears throat> calcium poor. Pyroxene, but the other two meteorites display a lot more variability, and I have here superimposed. Um, 
in blue the fields for diogenites. Um, <clears throat> so it's showing a similar bimodal type of pyroxene composition with a lot more um, diversity. And uh, I should note also that none of these phases display any kind of zoning. Um, all of these different compositions are different grains. And that makes sense if you think of this as a, as a breccia that's sampling a accumulate pile, because you would have different compositions of feldspars um, in different regions of a, of, a cumulate, of a cumulate pile, if that's what this is. And because it's brecciated, we're giving, we're giving a much uh, broader sampling of this. So <clears throat> it's actually uh, quite nice that these meteorites are brecciated because we're sampling a larger area. Um, next is uh, feldspar composition. Um, initially, when we were looking at NWA 12 217, we didn't think that these meteorites were related to the HED meteorites or any of the Vestoids because they were showing this kind of bimodal um, <coughs> plagioclase, uh, sorry, feldspar composition of, of some plagioclase that was quite albitic. And then this, this case bar. And you can see here, this is an example of this, this case bar. So this is all olivine surrounding uh, these, these grains here um, in the surrounding area. And then this is a feldspar in here. And this, this one has this, uh, this um, X solution pattern where uh, some of these lathes are actually silica. So, <clears throat> and the, so it's K feldspar and silica um, exalting from each other. And uh, I'm interpreting this to mean that these are sort of these late stage melt inclusion pockets um, and not necessarily reflective of the primary uh, feldspar composition um, of, the, of, these, of these meteorites. Um, if you look over here, these are the few feldspars that I was able to find in the other meteorites. So in NWA 12562 and 12319, there are <clears throat> these uh, these nice little inclusions. Instead, the feldspars are just kind of scattered throughout the, the breccia. And the compositions that we were able to measure are plotting uh, in a much more uh, interfitic range. And in blue, I have the feldspar ranges of the HED meteorites. And you can see there's like quite a bit of overlap um, between them. Sultan, uh, uh, just, just a comment here. Um, very interesting stuff, of course, but um, to me, I, I think the case for um, HAD uh, connection is stronger for um, 12319 uh, and 12562, which basically, I, which I look to me like they're just pairs. But 12217, 12, uh, you know, both from the what we're looking at here and also in the in terms of oxygen isotopes, I think mm -hmm. it's more of a stretch. Um, okay. It may be. I mean, they are ultra. They're all ultra here. All olivine rich, but I think um, we uh, there there might be a case made that they're that they're still not related. Um, anyway, just a comment. Mm. Yeah, um, that's definitely a, a possibility. Um, I think if we found uh, more calcic plagioclase in 217, then it might um, bolster that case. But yeah, the, they, they are like pretty different in terms of uh, the brecciation style. But then in other respects, I mean, they're really similar and there's a lot of overlap in composition between these meteorites. So yeah, that's... <clears throat> It's definitely not um, fully resolved. Um, <clears throat> I have a quick, quick question, sort of a follow-on to Carl, but to Carl, um, for the HEDs. I mean, is it do, are, do they commonly have K feldspars? So the there are there have been diogenites found with melt inclusions that contain a potassium feldspar like really small little pockets that contain um, evolved material. And it's really rare, but um, it does happen. I mean, you get, you get, you know, melt inclusions in many igneous rocks. Um, I don't know, if, Carl, you wanted to add anything to that? No, I mean, I think you've got a good point here. I mean, at first when we saw these, um, and you, you know, saw these uh, two feldspars, 
we're thinking like, well, this is no way this could be a uh, an HED. Um, but 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 I think there's there's a good case that Zoltan is making that these are not primary feldspars. Um, you know, they're not like um, they don't represent anything like what would be found in the um, you know the the first crystals out of the out of the melt. You know. Ah, uh, got it. Okay. Okay. So so I think there's still hope, but uh, but uh, again, uh, yeah. So th this is kind of related. Zoltana, when you were saying that this is like restite, is that right? Well, a cumulate uh, phase that maybe incorporated some of the, the melts from a fractionating melt magma chamber. That's, that's what I think. <clears throat> okay. Um, and yeah, I, I think 217 is also sampling a smaller, like if say all these meteorites are sampling a fractionating uh, magma chamber, like a cumulate pile, I think 217 is, is sampling a, a smaller uh, portion of it. Um, but given the larger uh, diversity that we'll see in, in, in other respects too, like in minor element chemistry, and there's a lot of other um, lines of evidence that say that the other two are, are sampling more of this material. Um, Given that it's, yeah, well, I'm, we're not really sure about this, to be honest. This 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 case feldspar, I think more um, more investigation needs to be done. But I don't I don't think it's it's a it's definitely not a primary phase, like a liquidus phase or anything like that, or or like you'd find in the other HUD meteorites of the primary plagioclase. Um. So anyway, so that's that's uh, that's feldspars. Um, there are also chromites in all of these meteorites. They're fairly similar in all their compositions. Um, they're variable in magnesium and iron content and aluminum and chromium content with aluminum substituting for chromium. Um, then um, we did find uh, in 217 um, what appears to be a melt pocket. So this is, I think, a late stage trapped melt that's interestingly different than the, the, the one with the case bar. Um, this one contains merylite uh, with around half a weight percent of fluorine, along with uh, high CA, pyroxene, and, um, and plagioclase. Um, so maybe these melt pockets have differing compositions. Um, that's sort of not clear at this point, but, but I don't think that any of these are <clears throat> something, or any of these, uh, these phases in here are reflective of the, the, the dominant like uh, petrology of these rocks. Um, like, I don't think any of these are like liquid, liquidus phases or anything. I think these are reflective of trapped melt that has to do with um, the fractionating magma chamber. Um, and then finally, um, there's iron nickel metal in all of these samples. Um, the nickel comp content is variable and it seems to be well, equi uh, well equilibrated. So there's no kind of primary zoning that you'd see in like a, in a primitive uh, achondrite. <clears throat> um, and just briefly regarding these symplectites, um, I'm bringing these up because these are diagnostic of these, me these uh, meteorites too. So these are composed of chromite, which are these, these bright blades in, the, in here, um, orthopyroxene and clinopyroxene, which are both uh, between these, these layers, and they're generally found completely enclosed within olivine, um, sometimes between olivine and pyroxene, uh, sometimes completely enclosed in olivine, sometimes on the border of one olivine grain. Um, it's kind of, they're just kind of randomly distributed uh, throughout <clears throat> the meteorite. And these are found in all three. So when we were trying to make a case for 12.562 and 12.319 being related to 12.217, I did make sure and find these, uh, these symplectites in all three of these meteorites and they're identical. Um, Similar features are also found in terrestrial peridotites, um, knock lights, lunar meteorites, and uh, this meteorite QUE 93148, which is an olivine rich meteorite of which we have about a gram total, um, but that a lot has been written about. Um, and these, these, these symplectites are associated with olivine plagioclase boundaries in lunar rocks. Um, Steve Alardo uh, wrote a paper on this in 2012. 
Um, I don't think that these are anything like those because they're never really found in association with plagioclase. As I said, plagioclase is a really minor phase in these meteorites, and these are just um, sort of found anywhere. <clears throat> um, there also can be a breakdown product of pyropic garnet in terrestrial lertolites. So this was uh, this is one idea of how these these things form: is that you have garnet and uh, it, it breaks down to form these, these symplectic phases, but that's all, again difficult. If this came from a small parent body, then how do you produce garnet? You know, you need about one and a half gigapascals to produce uh, garnet, and small bodies are just not capable of doing that because the, the pressure is just not high enough even in the core of these things. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, there's augite magnetite symplectites found in knocklites, but these are similar too. But these are unique in that they're not quite like any of those phases. Um, this is showing um, a backscattered electron and then, and then uh, qualitative x-ray maps showing different elements of these, these materials. Um, so you can see the chromite is, is zoned in these lathes. And then the calcium maps are showing where the clinopyroxene is located within these, these phases. <coughs> Whereas the magnesium is showing um, Sorry, warm colors mean more, cool colors mean less. Um, the magnesium, high magnesium areas are showing where the orthopyroxene is in these, these layers. Um, and yeah. Uh, what's interesting about these is they're definitely not uh, related to shock because a lot of them are overprinted by um, fractures. So you can see one of these symplectites here. It was like a vein-like uh, morphology originally that was then fractured in several places, um, presumably by shock and the brecciation that led to these meteorites. Um, here's another one that's been completely sheared across um, by shock. So symplectites can be found associated with shock, but these likely are not. Um, and then there are these veins that cut across these meteorites. Um, these are ubiquitous in all of them. And there are these, these dark veins that we originally thought were maybe shock melt veins. Uh, they don't seem to be that. Although interestingly, they're surrounded by um, undulose extinction. Um, <clears throat> here's a backscatter electron view, some backscatter electron views of some of these veins. And they're generally composed of high CA pyroxene, um, sulfide, and uh, sometimes plagioclase, and then sometimes these uh, these chromites. <clears throat> oh, sorry, sometimes uh, chromites, and sometimes the chromites are in the form of symplectites. So if you really strain your eyes, you can sort of see some of these symplectite features that appear within these veins. So I think the veining is related to the symplectites, and that they're formed by some sort of metasomatism or something similar to that. Um, so, in terms of parent body origin for these meteorites, um, if we look at all of the other olivine-rich meteorites, um, so are these related to urolites? Uh, according to the oxygen isotopes, they're not. Um, there's, no reduced C in, uh, there's no reduced carbon in any of these meteorites. And then if we look at the olivine, uh, calcium, and chromium content, you can see that all three of these meteorites group pretty tightly here. Um, they're really low in terms of chromium and, and calcium found in, in olivine, whereas some of these other primitive mitochondria <coughs> groups um, are more varied. Um, the urolites plot over here. So I think it's really unlikely here that, that these are associated with the urolites. Um, what about the angrites? Um, I think it's also unlikely that these have anything to do with the angrites, given um, olivine calcium content. The angrites wouldn't even plot on here, so they'd be somewhere up, you know, way up here. There are like weight percent levels of calcium in, in all of the Indian angrites. And their iron to manganese is about twice as much, is about to, twice as high as uh, found in, uh, in these ultramafic achondrites. So I don't think it's likely that they're associated with uh, angrites. Um, and so that basically leaves, according to oxygen isotope systematics, are these associated with the brachinites or the HEDs? Um, if we look at trace element geochemistry, so this is recently done by um, Sigil, the uh, <coughs> Scripps Isotope Geochemistry Laboratory. Um, James Day and Marine Paquette uh, analyzed the trace element isotope systematics in these. Um, and you can see that these are form a broadly similar pattern to um, the HED meteorites, which are in red, and the brachinites in green. So this, this doesn't really tell us much other than it's an overall largely um, chondritic um, 
rare earth element pattern. Um, two of these meteorites show a slight enrichment in um, in light rare earth elements, whereas another one shows more of a kind of a depleted um, pattern. Um, but overall, a plot in the general vicinity of both the Brachionites and the and the uh, the the Diogenites. Sorry, yeah, the, the red is here is in is uh, Diogenites. Um, but if we look at the highly siderophile element abundances, these are a lot more telling. So I have pl <coughs> plotted here the range of the Diogenites in red, um, the range of the Brachionites in green, and then the ultramafic achondrites are these white um, white lines. And you can see that their their patterns are broadly chondritic. Um, oh yeah, and here is uh, Earth and Mars. So Earth is in blue and Mars is in purple, um, the, the mantles of these planets. And you can see that their highly siderophile element abundances are lower than all these, and they plot in the general range of the Diogenites. So this essentially rules out association with the Brachionites. As the Brachionites are primitive achondrites, um, they retain a higher siderophile element, um, highly siderophile element concentration than the Diogenites, or Earth and Mars. And this is thought to be because <clears throat> as primitive achondrites, their residues of partial melting, and they are from a parent body that never experienced a core mantle um, segregation event, which would highly deplete um, the highly siderophile elements. And these planets are, <clears throat> the Earth and Mars and the Diogenites are relatively high in uh, highly siderophile elements, suggesting that after this core mantle segregation event, um, this late veneer of contradictory material replenished the highly siderophile element concentration in these, in these bodies. And that's kind of what's suggested for these new meteorites as well, that they're from a body that experienced a core mantle differentiation, and then the, uh, <coughs> the highly siderophile elements were replenished in contradictory abundances um, by the late veneer. Without the late veneer, you have a non chondritic abundance of these uh, these materials. So so that's what suggests this. So um, uh, Zoltan, remind us again what this pattern would look like due to core formation. Um, it would be not a straight line. I know, but I, that's what I'm asking. <laughs> um, yeah, where, I'm not... where, where, where are the depletions and where are the enrichment? I mean, Obviously, you're going to fractionate some of these uh, highly siderophile elements from each other. So, which ones go into the, which are the most siderophile? Um, I'm, I'm not actually sure whether this is arranged in like less siderophile than more siderophile, I think. It might be actually, but yeah, it might slope downward. I think, yeah, right. I think it goes, I think it goes, yeah, downward. If I had to yeah. guess, but again, that's a guess. I'm, I'm really not sure. I should yeah. probably know that. Um, yeah, I mean, the other hypothesis is that the reason why Earth and Mars sit up higher is because of high pressure core formation, especially Earth. I mean, Mars is, uh, you know, it also has significant high pressures. And so the, the idea is that, um, you know, I'm not arguing this, but I think it's there's an argument to be made for the moderately siderophile elements like nickel and cobalt, but you know the the um, you see higher you see overall higher higher metal higher siderophile abundances in Earth and Mars, and some of it can be due to to high pressure. So, like for example, when you look at olivines from Earth, if you look at, if you get a meteor wrong, okay. Right. One of the first things that you can see in there in the olivines lots of times is high nickel. And that, that's indicative of the Earth's higher nickel content in the, in the crust and in the, and in the upper mantle. Uh, but the same is actually true if you, to some degree for, for Martian meteorites as well. Um, anyway, right. the question I would have is why that that I mean, maybe what's interesting here is maybe what this is showing that these um, these small bodies all formed um, before or um, or at least um, during the the late the late what is it called 
the late veneer. Yeah. So so they were either they either got a small small amount of the late veneer, or they didn't get it. And Earth and Mars took longer to form, obviously, right? Right. I mean, we don't have any ages on these, but you know, it's possible that these things are older than the Earth, right? These these achondrites. I mean, a lot of a lot of achondrites are older than the Earth. Right. Well, yeah, the, these smaller bodies had to have dif melted and differentiated and then crystallized um, within the first few million years of solar right. system history, whereas larger bodies might have had these protracted mag magma ocean phases. Um, yeah. So, and what's interesting about the Diogenites is the Diogenites show a huge range, like five orders of magnitude of diversity when it comes to these, um, <clears throat> these highly siderophile element concentrations. Suggesting that maybe this late veneer, um, you know, re replenishment of highly siderophile elements was heterogeneous, had, uh, <clears throat> like there was poorly mixed and heterogeneous. Um, well, well, you know, you, I mean, if you look at HEDs, I mean, like for example, the the um, uh, the Howardites, uh, it's not, it's not, you know, it's. I'm not sure exactly how common it is, but you, you do see, uh, for example, CM2 class a lot mm -hmm. in Howardites. Right. So, so um, that that right there is a you know that's a late veneer, right? right? I mean that's a that's a carbonaceous chondrite that's mixed in with uh, with the Howardite. So that could cause some of the diogenites to have maybe higher siderophile element mm -hmm. uh, values. Clearly, Definitely. Vesta ha clearly Vesta has a has carbonaceous chondrite component in it. If the, if that's where the Howardites are from, right? Well, it's that brings up whether you know the Howardites represent bulk Vesta or whether they represent you know regolith and, and exogenous right. mixing and all that. But I mean, you can see macroscopic evidence for a late veneer, right? In the in the in the Howardites. Not so much for the diogenite. I don't know if any diogenite breaches that have CM2 class, but you do see it in the Howardites. Um, I don't think so because yeah. they're they're more you know igneous rocks. So sure, sure. But the you know the point is that they they record this replenishment process. Um, yeah. Which you know maybe as Vesta was differentiating, probably before the the kind of regolith gardening that, that you see, you know, in, in the Howardites, um, it's also recording the process. Um, so I'm showing here, uh, in addition to that, the rhenium osmium uh, isotopic um, diagram, just to show that uh, you might be wondering what this palladium enrichment is, and this also this rhenium enrichment in um, NWA12562. Um, and basically, this is showing that all of these these rocks uh, so, uh, sort of plot along this this isochron, um, this 4.56 million year isochron for in rhenium osmium space. But 12562 deviates from this in terms of its rhenium composition, but not its osmium composition. So its osmium isotopic composition is pretty much the same as, as the other rocks, but its rhenium div diverges so far. And this is typical of desert meteorites. This suggests that, that this meteorite experienced some sort of uh, late addition of uh, rhenium, and then that would have also that would also explain the palladium addition. And so that's just suggesting that these are uh, weathering products. So without this this weathering process, you would also have a, an overall chondritic um, shape to this highly siderophile element pattern. Um, so I think this essentially rules out association with the Brachonites. I mean, other things roll it out too, but at, at this point we've narrowed it down to either these are related to the HED meteorites or they're from a unique parent body. Um, it looks like it's palladium, isn't it? Yeah, palladium and rhenium. Okay. So basically rhenium, where, palladium would be, would be coupled to-, to Where rhenium. is it coming from? Where is it coming from? Um, the desert. But what do you mean? I mean, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no palladium uh, deposits out there in the desert, right? So, how does this uh, happen? I don't, I'm. I, um, what, well, the literature what? suggests that this is common in desert really? meteorites. I'm not entirely what? sure about the process. Yeah. I'd, okay. But it's essentially argued that it's terrestrial palladium. Um, huh. Yeah, I don't. 
don't know. <laughs> you might want to, if you're going to talk about that, you might want to uh, to back it up with a reference, specific reference or something, because or how it actually happens. Because to me, this looks weird. Yeah, only one um, of the analyses is enriched in uh, rhenium, not both. Yeah, not, not exactly. Um, so this one, yeah, this this enrichment one is is, is this this uh, really wild uh, rhenium osmium. I mean, I mean, it could also one, be I mean, a lab art. It, it is enriched; it's just not as much. Um, so. so it's not a possible that it was a lab uh, a lab uh, contamination. Um, yeah, I mean, ask James Day. He did the analysis. <laughs> I'm sure he will say the data are perfect. He said, quote unquote, late edition, you know, and I was just like, okay, yeah. so weathering. And he was like, yeah, weathering. So, um, no, I'm, I'm not entirely sure about how that would happen via weathering, but I'll definitely look into that. Just yeah. as a matter of, just as a matter of record, I just checked the weathering uh, level on 12562 and it did come in as low. Hmm. Um, I think all of them have kind of similar weathering levels, right? Yeah, like they're all low. fusion crusted. Yeah. They all have fusion crust. So one, I think one of the things that might be interesting to find out or think about would be uh, in order for this kind of terrestrial terrestrialization and enrichment of, of these elements, you know, how long does it have to be on earth before you would start to see that because to me uh, if it says the weathering is low and assuming that's correct i mean is is that quote unquote long enough to get these sorts of enrichments well i think you you really don't need a lot since the, since the hsc com content is so low in these meteorites you really don't need a lot to do this sort of thing so yeah i'm, I'm not sure sounds like a paper <laughs> great or, or or a remeasurement yeah uh, well i mean it might it could be a nugget effect too um yeah, yeah. so it could yeah. be just a chunk of you know this iron nickel metal in there that messed yeah. it up but that's also uh that needs i'd have to look into that of like how these highly suitable elements would fractionate within um a metal nugget in, in one of these meteorites, that would be an interesting thing to find out. But that'd be really difficult to do, given yeah. that these are bulk measurements. Yeah. Um, so anyway, moving on. Um, interestingly, uh, there are um, olivine rich materials, and in particular, uh, you know, forsteritic uh, you know, basically ultramathic materials that have been identified in, in Howardites. Um, so Han et al. 2018 found these uh, <clears throat> these these clasts within within Howardites, um, and you can see here they are highly forsteritic, highly enstatitic um, clasts that look pretty similar to the olivines that we we see in in the ultramathic achondrites. And they also have these symplectites in them that are pretty much identical to um, to the the meteorites, to the symplectites that we identified in these meteorites. Um, so <clears throat> that is another clue that these might be related to to Vesta, since these seem to be included in in Howardites. Um, the Han et al. found that the geochemical trend exhibited by these these mg rich hardsburgites as he called as they called them um, to be discontinuous with the diogenites so this is from their paper um, showing the magnesium number of pyroxene plotted against various um, minor element ratios and um, for some reason they plotted uh, their analyses of mg rich hardsburgites in the same color scheme as they did with their their Diogenites, but the, the point is that they, they form these discontinuous trends. So if you look at AL for CA, um, for example, in um, with magnesium number, you can see that the magnesium rich Hartsburgites form this, this reverse trend, whereas the diogenites form this, this trend that goes the other way, um, essentially. And they basically interpreted this to mean that <clears throat> these were um, completely separate from that they, these weren't just diogenated class, that these were their own thing. Um, and you can see this 
as well in the aluminum uh, aluminum to titanium ratio. Um, you see these two distinct trends developed for the magnesium rich Hardsbergites versus the, the diogenites. Um, so what happens if we plot our meteorites um, with these groups? Um, so you can see in red is diogenites, in yellow is magnesium rich Hardsbergites, and then the R3 meteorites. And you can see in these same trends, they seem to subsume uh, these, these geochemical trends found in, in these magnesium rich Hartsburgites. So they, it looks like they span the entire composition of the diogenites, the, the Hartsburgites, and then, and then some basically. Um, so it looks like our breccias are sampling a much greater uh, heterogenetic diversity in terms of pyroxene composition, um, which is interesting. So this would suggest that if these are, you know, from Vesta, then these magnesium-rich Hartsburgites are just one end member of this, this trend found by the HEDs. And then since ours is a breccia sampling a, a cumulate pile, so a wide variety of composition, we're um, just kind of overlapping this, this entire trend, um, except for in aluminum per calcium. Um, so here, we don't see any overlap between these, these two fields. <coughs> um, if we look at olivine compositions, um, so now I'm showing uh, iron to manganese versus iron to magnesium composition. Uh, if you'll recall, I showed um, this similar diagram for the um, primitive achondrites. And these primitive achondrites are on here again, so they form this sort of redox trend um, in this space. So the brachinites and the urolites plot along here, whereas the MG-rich Hartsburgites, um, the HED meteorites are out here. Uh, again, it's hard to find olivine in, in HED meteorites in general. So these are the few analyses that we have, uh, but they generally form this sort of trend. Um, if you can call it that, it's more of a blob. Um, whereas the ultra-mafic achondrites form this pretty clear linear trend along this igneous uh, differentiation. Kind of yeah, Zoltan, you have to be um, careful about olivines, though, in, uh, in, uh, especially in, in uh, eucrites, because um, a lot of those are what you might even consider to be late stage. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're found sometimes in, uh, on grain boundaries that look like have been altered by some sort of fluids. So, um, and I don't know, you know, where these, uh, these red data come from, but um, there is a significant difference between, uh, let's say a primary, what we would consider an olivine coming out of a magma and then olivine forming, you know, again, in, on, by some secondary process in, mm -hmm. in Eucrites. So, so there is, it, it's a, I think it's a little tricky getting into, into that realm, but I'm, you know, anyway, just be aware of that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, these are, <clears throat> these are points that are, I just called them from the literature, basically. Yeah. All the, all the olivines yeah. I could find in any HD meteorite. I, I think um, there are, there are some that are even more iron rich. Right. Uh, you know, we've, we've looked at, I mean, I've, I've had some recently, they're really tiny little things, you know, mm -hmm. and then you find some in there, some of them are almost well, they're not pure phthalite, but they're very, very phthalitic. You know, they get up to, I think, off the chart here, even some of them, you know, to the right. Right. So I think it, I think that's a little tricky. But okay. yeah, like you said, you don't have much to work with there. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So regardless of whether these HEVs are valid, maybe some of them are, some of them aren't. Um, the, yeah. The MG-rich Hartsburgites and the ultra-rafic achondrites are definitely forming this kind of tight grouping sure. that is, uh, yeah, yeah, that's reflective fine. of igneous fractionation. Yeah, I mean, that's fine. You need to balance that with something. Uh, right. There should be, you know, the big, well-defined cluster on the left, there has to be something to balance it on the right. It could be those red dots, but it could also be something that's just missing, right? Right. And so. Okay, so, <clears throat> um, Moving on to petrogenesis of these, these objects. Um, so everything so far points to these retrosampling sampling accumulate pile from a fractionating magma chamber. Um, and we think that the parent body is likely Vesta. We don't know for sure, but it seems to make sense at this point. Um, 
So Mandler and Alkins Tanton just have this cartoon figure of how this might have happened. Um, and the idea is that you have uh, you know, accretion of, of Vesta um, and melting due to impacts and then decay of aluminum 26 into this magma ocean. Whether or not there was a magma ocean is kind of secondary to this. But uh, the, the main idea is that you know, after this magma ocean solidifies, you have this residual melt that forms these, uh, these, these magma chambers closer to the surface. Um, and then uh, basically accumulate um, mantle. And then within these, these fractionating magma chambers, you have, uh, you have basically a cumulant pile of, you know, going from olivine rich material to diogenetic material to finally eucrite material on, on the surface and in the form of um, extrusive magmas or extrusive uh, lavas. Um, interestingly, a uh, recent study um, has found an olivine rich layer exposed um, by this Aruntia crater, which is a crater on the northern hemisphere of Vesta. So I am by no means a um, <clears throat> spectro, like I, this isn't my area of uh, absorption spectrometry, but um, this paper by Cheek and Sunshine from 2020 thinks that there is a, an olivine rich layer um, exposed by these, uh, by these craters. And uh, what's interesting is that this is the, um, the stratigraphy they came up with given this data. And they, they, they think that they found a, a eucrite rich layer overlain by an olivine rich layer, which is then overlain by a diagenate la rich layer. And then everything is overprinted by, or everything on the top is, is, is Howardite. So you know, these mixed uh, regular freshes. But the fact that an olivine rich layer overlies a eucrite rich layer argues for, instead of a, you know, these olivine rich materials, instead of being formed by a fractionating um, magma chamber and solidification of, a, of an olivine rich, or sorry, solidification by an olivine rich mantle, um, instead it argues for something like serial magmatism producing these, these shallow uh, layered intrusions. And this is kind of like what um, Chip Shearer argued for in, with, uh, with uh, his uh, <coughs> model for best in uh, differentiation. Um, um, so that's essentially what we have so far. Uh, I'll just leave this summary slide up here. So basically these, these ultramafic achondrites, they don't seem to be related to rachinites, urolites, engrites, any of the, uh, <coughs> any of the, um, uh, primitive achondrites. Instead, they're likely these cumulate rocks, and they're not like melt residues. They're more like fractionating, um, <clears throat> produced by fractional crystallization. They're low, highly siderophile element con <clears throat> contents that are contradict suggest they formed on a fully differentiated body that experienced late addition. And so we think that they're potentially from one of these shallow, layered intrusions, uh, these magma chambers on, on Vesta. Um, and future work includes um, titanium and chromium isotopic measurements that uh, Jing Zhu Yin is, is now going to be doing. Um, and once we measure that, then hopefully that will shed some light on whether these are actually from Vesta. So that'll be kind of the nail in the coffin for, uh, for, um, for parent body origin. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you very much. So we have time for some questions. Um, anybody want to chime in? Please feel free. I have a question. Is that uh, stratigraphic sequence you just showed thought to be inverted at all? It was surprising to see like eucrites below the olivine rich and diogenite rich layers, but eucrites are more like basaltic. Could that be an inverted flap from the crater? Um, yeah, I mean, it could be, I and mean, it could be the crater's overprinting material that's already been disturbed by other cratering events. Uh, they don't, the authors of the paper don't really go into it, but, but they, I mean, they thought that basically you have, you know, the sort of serial magnetism that's ongoing. And so you in place various, I guess it's, you know, like a layered intrusion, it's essentially, so you have multiple layer and in, layered intrusions on top of each other. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know what to I mean, I, I think it's just kind of a stretch to uh, suggest that based on just, you know, remote sensing data. But I mean, that's, that's kind of all we have right now.
for all of you rich material. Makes sense that the Howardites on top, but I wouldn't expect Eucrites to be at the bottom of. Right. Yeah. So there, it was an unexpected. This this is why they because you know this there's this ongoing debate over whether Vesta experienced a magma ocean, all about you know stratification of a magma ocean, and that's where this it's all being rich material, uh, that's how it forms, and that's how you stratify the diogenites and the, the eucrites, or whether it's ongoing serial magmatism, you know, low degrees of partial melting that um, leave, I don't know, olivine rich residues and produce these, these layered intrusions. So if that's true, then it's not what, you know, it, it could be a possibility that you produce one layered intrusion on top of another one, and it's stratified like that, but yeah. It's kind of the idea. Any others? Sure, Anthony. Well, Tom, good work. Um, were the chromite compositions like the chrome number and magnesium number similar to what we see in the diogenites? Um, I'm not sure about that. I'll have to look. Uh, what do we generally see in Oh, diogenites. I mean, you go to the chromite. Uh, typically, I guess they're they're more on the chrome rich, and I don't see the chrome numbers here. I'm looking at middle felt at all, 2015, as a reference. And of course, I asked a question, and I don't have the numbers right off the top of my. Yeah, head. I don't. Uh, I'm not sure, but that's that's. I'll definitely look into that. That's. Um, there, there is a high amount of variability. I'm not sure that the diogenites have that kind of variability Correct. in terms of in terms of chromite compositions. And just real quick, would you mind going back to the trace element diagram? Sure. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate you going back. I was just curious. I, I must have fallen asleep or something when looking at it, but it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, the, <clears throat> the REs, this is something I forgot to mention, is that the, the overall shape of the pattern suggests that um, the diversity in incompatible trace elements is just due to the amount of pyroxene that each of these meteorites has. So, one two five six two and one two three nineteen has more pyroxene, so it's enriched in REEs and presumably in other trace elements as well, um, relative to one two two one seven. O overall, though, uh, you know the shapes are largely the same. There are some of those other uh, trace elements. Uh, like cerium that are indicative of terrestrial alteration. Uh, right. Have you seen that paper by Crozaz at all? Yeah. yeah, the cerium anomaly. Yeah, we didn't really see that here. So. Yeah. I don't think that these are terribly weathered, personally. Doesn't look like uh, it. No, I don't think they are. No. So I think, um, yeah. You know, uh, Zoltan, I think... Uh, could we go back to the oxygen isotope uh, diagram that you showed? Sure. So, you know, um, John Wasson, for example, and some others have argued that there's there's more than one Vesta, <laughs> you know, uh, or, the, right. or that the HEDs don't even come from Vesta. They come from someplace else. But, um, you know, uh, there is a, there is a, probably even more data here than what you're showing for HEDs. Um, there are uh, quite a number of um, so-called anomalous eucrites and mm -hmm. so on. And, um, you know, if, if I saw these white da data points all plotting down in that zone, that tight zone that, that sits down in there, that for example, Greenwood, they argue that it's very tight. You know, they argue that the eucrites are just very, you know, it's very, very tight. Uh, range. Um, but there are these others that sit up higher, you know, like Passamonte, I think is up in there, Ibatira, a couple, you know, and probably more than actually that we know about. Uh, and so I'm wondering, you know, if what we're actually seeing here is another parent body. 
um, or that there is, or that Vesta is heterogeneous. You know, I mean, it's one of the, so, you know, so you're talking about these things coming from Vesta, but that's a, that's a pretty big range for oxygen isotopes from, for an igneous body. And, and so you need to try to explain that. The other possibility is that there's just the, that there, are, that there are other, that there are more Vestoids. And what you're doing, what you're sampling is a Vestoid. It might be interesting to go and look at some of these um, these HEDs and see if there is anything that that they have in common with your meteorites. These that's my, oh, you mean the the anomalous ones? Yeah, like Ibatera, yeah. for example. Um, again, I my preference is that it's not from Vesta; that it is actually look, that we're looking at another parent body here that's nested nested here in this diagram between the angrites and the and the eucrites and, and carl i think there's another one also which is sarah palata which uh ching shu um did some additional research on and said that it was anomalous as well which is one yeah. of the more recent ones right and the other thing that we can do is get more chromium data uh you know to look at this in the chromium plot to see yeah, the the chromium titanium data, I think, will, will, yeah, yeah. Be, I don't think so, we can say whether it's from Vesta or not. Yeah. Before that. Yeah. But but what might be emerging from this is that this either Vesta is heterogeneous in oxygen isotopes, or that we're looking at one or more parent bodies, uh, more than one parent body. Yeah, I wouldn't anyway. be surprised by Vesta being heterogeneous. I mean, if if it never had a magma ocean, then. It's well, but, if you talk, but if you read Greenwood's paper, he argues exactly the opposite. Right. He said he says, "Oh, look at these eucrites. They're just they're they're absolutely there's hardly any variation, you know. And if you if you plot his data on this on this plot, they're going to look. They're, you're not going to see as much scatter. And so his argument is there was a magma ocean on Vesta. That's exactly right. what he's arguing. And um, but but you know the the braconites show this sort of scatter, and um, you know there's an argument that that's a heterogeneous parent body. But the braconites also, as you pointed out, uh, sort of lack igneous differentiation trends. Um, so, and they're you know they're pretty they're not they're not a they're not a really wide range of igneous rock types either that you have, for example, in the represented in the HEDs. Anyway, right. I think that, that you should definitely include that in the discussion as a possibility that that it's not that it's not necessarily what that we're we're looking at Vesta, but we may be actually looking at more complexity. Or um, it's Vesta, or Vesta is heterogeneous. But if you if you propose that Vesta is heterogeneous, then you need to come up with a model to explain it. Right. Well, if it's I mean, if it's a serial magnetism kind of thing, then then that would ex maybe provide a, an explanation for the heterogeneity. No, because the moon. I mean, the moon doesn't have a. The moon has serial magnetism, and you don't see a wide range of oxygen isotopes in the moon. Well, but the and, moon had a magma ocean before that. Well, maybe. I mean, you, that's a possibility. I mean, but Dave Walker's model shows serial. You know, his model of the crust formation of the moon does not have a mag motion. It's caused by serial magnetism. Anyway, I, I think I, I think it's hard to, to produce um, a lot of scatter in the uh, in the oxygen isotopes through igneous processes. Is my is my point. Thanks so much, Zoltan, for your uh, talk. It's very interesting. Uh, it was great. And uh, keep up the good work. Thanks yes, to thank everybody you. for a lot. <clears throat> yeah. Thank Thanks, you. Mendy. Thanks, Anthony, for attending. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Good job. Uh, we'll see you guys next time. Mm -hmm.